Well, it's a great honor for me to be here and uh, give you a little bit about my background. I uh, came here uh, to Scripps at Brain Physical Lab in 1973, about 10 years after I'd gotten my PhD from MIT while I was in the Navy. And while I was, right after I got out of MIT, I decided that if I wanted to stay technical, I had to do something that the Navy was interested in. So I got into sonars and underwater acoustics and things like that, never having taken a course in anything of those. And uh, my background is similar to arts, but has not been contaminated by the university quite as long as he has, <laughs> and, and faced many practical problems. Okay, so I'm, that's the, I'm an engineer, uh, not an acoustician, though I did get my undergraduate in physics. So I'm, a, I'm sort of the uh, fish out of water here in this group. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about coherence, and I can give you, an, uh, my thrust has always been, how do we apply various results to problems that the Navy has. And in order to apply the results, I need to try to understand the results. So that's what I've been struggling with. And to paraphrase a question that was presented to me not so long ago, uh, that question might be, why doesn't the Navy exploit the coherence of the ocean? And so uh, my true answer to that question is I don't know how. Uh, but uh, rather than make sure in the talk, we will go through the next one here. So I might say, uh, I got to do that myself, okay. What is meant by the, the ocean is very coherent? I've heard this, I think all of you have heard it. I've heard big committees explain how we ought to do things and experiments and what have you, but how are we going to use the coherence of the ocean? How are we going to exploit it in some way? So let me proceed by some definitions of coherence, okay? So we've heard it used in about five different ways already and it's only like two o'clock in the afternoon. So we all sort of know what it means, but we, no one knows precisely exactly what each individual meant. And so it's very hard to answer the general question about why we don't, maybe doesn't exploit it. But it's, in general, it means somehow we take uh, the phase into account, or we try to relate the predictability of something at one time or one space, spatial location, to that at another. All right? So that's what it's about. A coherent signal is a pure tone or some other periodic thing, okay, that you can predict the future based on the current thing. All right? A coherence time is the durance, the duration over which it's predictable, you know? Uh, Temporal coherence is the degree of phase predictability from one time to another. Coherence distance is the distance over which a phase relationship exists. Spatial coherence is the degree of phase predictability from one position to another. Uh, coherent multipath, that's when we think there's a fixed phase relationship between different multipath components. Broadband coherence is the predictability of a broadband waveform from uh, uh, some other thing that's usually measured by the peak of a normalized correlation function. And we talk about coherent processing, and that's something that tries to provide, to com combine components in phase based on a hypothesis about a phase relationship so that one gets 10 log of the number of uh, things that are being combined over noise rather than five log, which would be associated with the noise improvement due to incoherent processing. So those are all a bunch of different uh, uh, definitions and it hasn't helped me answer my question about why the Navy hasn't exploited it. So I'm gonna talk about a number of potential, since I don't have to go to sea and make measurements like all you oceanographers to, to earn a living, I, I'm going to talk about some Gadakan experiments that one might perform and some data from experiments that were, would have been, have been performed. Okay, so let's take the simplest case. I have a single source and a single receiver, okay, and the signal that I receive is the sum of all the multipath components, each of which has their own amplitude, time delays, and phase relationships. Okay, if I have a fixed source and fixed receiver, I can get temporal coherence, okay, that's if I assume a narrowband signal. I observe the time history, 
over the amplitude and phase, and a received signal will then have a finite bandwidth, and the temporal coherence time might be the reciprocal of that bandwidth. So that's the spreading in, in Doppler, if you like, uh, due to motions, all right? If I have a fixed source and a uh, radially moving receiver, and I thought about a frozen ocean, if I have a narrow band signal, the radial motion converts the spatial structure of the ocean into a temporal structure, okay? And that spatial variability is due to the multipath uh, interference and leads to striations and spectrums. Okay, the distance between successive amplitude minima sometimes is called the radial coherence length. And that is also part of spectral striations. Now there's lots of other ways of interpreting that. One can interpret it as the uh, related to the angular spread in the multipath or the spread in wave number as given by the equation. I can also interpret it as the length of an N-fire line array that would resolve the multipath components, okay? It also may be interpreted as the differential Doppler between the two multipaths. All of these are equivalent interpretations of the same thing. And we can think of a coherence time associated with this moving source as the coherence length divided by the velocity. And that depends inversely at, on frequency, so that for low frequencies, I can get a very long coherence time, integrate a long time because things are very slowly, because it takes me a long time to go many multipath uh, wavelengths. All right. Now, if I have a single source and a broadband signal, it could be, uh, say, a broadband periodic signal. Uh, the broadband signal will resolve the multipath components in travel time, okay? And that gives the channel impulse response to Green's function. Okay, the impulse response will vary over time to the tempor temporal variability of the ocean. And I may observe the bulk delay, a transport delay on individual paths, so they may move respect to each other. I may correlate the match filter output of one arrival with the next time around or the several times around to, uh, with or without searching in bulk time delay or I can average with those at some other uh, spatial separation. So those are all different things I might do. All right. Now, there's some data. Oh, no. no. Oh, this is uh, time reversal. Time reversal uh, is related to lots of stuff that's been going on around here lately. Uh, first part is, is something that we do in communications in which they send a signal through a channel Okay, the resulting received signal is the convolution of the channel with the impulse response of the ch signal with the impulse response of the channel. We build a match filter, if you like, that tries to take the channel out of it, and you get something that's the autocorrelation of the channel with the signal that was transmitted. And we do this in communication, we call this adaptive equalization in order to get a better communication through a channel. And another thing one can do in this dates back to Antares Pavlescu many years ago. In fact, I even did a paper on it myself in 1993, which is a few months ago itself, and which is time reversal, and I called it, uh, what did I call it? Oh, uh, reciprocity-based communication compensation in a wideband channel, something like that. All right. So you, you take the signal and you try to take the channel out. So you pre-compensate and send it through the channel, does the correlation for you, and you get something out at the other end. Both of these two approaches give the same thing in a sense that the signal is involved with the delayed correlation of the channel itself. In the channel match filter, you use one signal to uh, estimate how to compensate for one uh, arise later. In time reversal, we use the channel at a later time to compensate for what happened earlier. The quality of the peak that we get from this is a measure of temporal stability, and we may use multiple receivers, and uh, it reminds me of an experiment we did when I was at the Model Basin many years ago that we had a wave maker. And as you've heard, and well know all you oceanographers, that the, the different velocities have different frequencies, so we generated a FM sweep, so they sent the high frequencies out first, and then the lower frequencies, and the waves all cut up without, in the middle of the basin, and splash everything, 
went up in the air and became nonlinear. They had a lot of stuff. So that's uh, the dispersion uh, situation that you get. This is some data that was recorded off uh, Fort Lauderdale. It's a very large array was placed on the bottom in a program called SWAP. This data was processed by Kevin Heaney, who was a student of Bill Cooperman's here and worked with me for a number of years. And what we're seeing is uh, some number of almost 500 and some hydrophones on the vertical. And there was a transmitter signal at, at first on the left side at a range of a little over eight kilometers. And it was a 400 hertz, hertz linear slide, FM slide, and it was match filtered. And down below, which is the same data as up above, it's been time adjusted, so things would line up according to the proper arrival time. And you're seeing, uh, you know, a little over a second of data there. A couple of interesting things about this first, first one. First is this uh, initial arrival, this one here, which by any definite definition would be thought as very coherent, okay? And it, this is a head wave. So it's not something that's propagating in the medium itself. It's an interface wave along the bottom of the ocean. Then there are several distinct arrivals, one, two, three, and across the length of this aperture, even when it's lined up, they vary, okay? And you might ask, well, what is the coherence length? Well, it depends what I'm really looking at. This is uh, same type of data, except this was a down sweep, this is an up sweep, and this happened about 400 meters later. And you see a similar type of phenomenon, but the difference between this and this is uh, significant. So you could say, well, given all this data, what do we mean by coherence? I could integrate this way. I could integrate from here to here. I can do all sorts of different comparisons in determine, trying to determine what the broadband coherence is. All right. Then there's the magnitude squared coherence function, which has been traditionally used as a measure of coherence between two things. And that's basically you measure the cross spectrum and you normalize it, okay? And you call that normalized cross spectral density the, uh, the coherence function or the Unfortunately, it depends on the bandwidth, the averaging time, and the signal-to-noise ratio. It's got very little to do with the distance between these two things, even though we call it spatial coherence. It's mainly a measure of temporal stability between the two channels that connect the source and two different receivers. So while it's called spatial coherence, it doesn't really depend very much on spatial coherence at all. It depends on that being a fixed phase relationship between this receiver and that receiver, okay, uh, which is, you know, again, liable to be confusing. It has certain properties bounded between zero and one. It's biased between these two bounds, okay? And unless you have enough averaging, you don't get anything useful. It measures the temporal stability of the narrowband phase, but not its complexity. It depends on the duration of the signal. The more I average, the less time, the less likely it is to be stable over that duration. The phase relationship is suppressed. That is, we're making no assumption about the phase relationship between the two components. We're really measuring whether there is a stable phase relationship. And taking advantage of that depends on how you're going to do it, okay? The value is reduced if the phase varies with frequency. So if I have too big a band, there won't be a constant phase within that band that will reduce it. And it's also reduced by receiver noise. And sometimes we use this as a measure of signal to noise ratio between two things we think that should be highly correlated. Okay, this, let me describe a very long range experiment. This was done in 1976. And the basic idea was there was a moving surface ship at very long range, received at two, rate, two receivers that were spaced apart. One of these happened to be fixed and the other happened to be moving, but that's not important. Okay, and the idea was that you would wonder what was going on here. Usually in these long range things at low frequencies, the motion of the sources dominates over the motion of the ocean, okay? 
Uh, so what the processing was is to compensate for the boat time delay based on this beam intersection, so you know those times, those two, those two things, and then you search in differential Doppler and finite time delay to uh, maximize this magnitude squared coherent function that we just had, okay? And these things were hundreds of miles. And people said, wow, wow, the ocean is really coherent. And, uh, well, it's not a surprise. The high signal to noise ratio uh, it shouldn't be a surprise because from a single receiver test, we know we could integrate for a long time before the motion had taken it away from something. So if something's only varying slowly from a fixed CW source, I have two of them, how far could they pass, could they wander away from each other? <coughs> Again, it's not coherent. Oh, there goes the time flies. It's not coherent processing because we search over delay and phase and make no hypothesis about the differential phase. This is good co for localization, but not for a coherent addition and it's not beamforming. Okay, again, this is a measure of the stability of the two channels or the motion uh, of the two sources over the time. Beamforming. Okay, that's what we're talking about when we're trying to get a real spatial gain. Okay, and that means that we're trying to add the signals received on multiple sensors using an hypothesized phase relationship, usually based on assumed geometry, plane wave, cylindrical wave, multipath, match field, etc. Typically, we use multiple hypotheses corresponding to multiple steering directions, and these are the assumptions that we're making about the phase relationship. An array gain is achieved by isolating the signal to a single beam while suppressing noise from other directions. And we get random addition of the noise and in phase addition of the signals. And a point of diminishing returns is reached when the beam gets to be too narrow to isolate the signal or side loads or when the side loads become too high. So that's usually what we're trying to do in beam forming and getting extra gain in terms of detecting uh, or tracking targets. Now, we then th think about if we're going to match two assumptions, we can think about the wave fronts that we might see. And the sim simplest wave front is a plane wave. Okay? We may have a curved wave front. This might be from near field or something else that was going on that was, was local. We can get the correlated wave front. This is something that John Colosi put up today, having to do with internal waves in the orthogonal direction. Oh, we get a multipath where we have two things coming in. So we might have a, a direct arrival and a bottom bounce bottle. We could have tilting wave fronts. So you can visualize I'm transmitting sound this way and something's coming in and the waveform tilts back and forth over time, or it could flex in and out over time. Now this typical measure of coherence function, magnitude squared, can't tell the difference between these two things. So you can see that there's a problem in trying to draw inferences about what we mean if I say this is very coherent. A time domain beamformer requires no temporal averaging. Okay, so it just looks at the instantaneous wavefront based on an assumption about an instantaneous wavefront. So in this tilting case, it would come in one beam at one time and a different beam at another time. And in this flexing case, it wouldn't it might come in phase for a little bit and then go out of focus and defocus. Again, the effects are very different depending on uh, what's the underlying detail of what's going on. Oh, yeah, we're very much interested in horizontal rays uh, and their multipath arrivals. The horizontal rays have conical beam patterns, so they can't tell up from down, okay? And um, so if I'm steering near broadside and the, all the multipaths are combined to the to a vertical plane, then I get just one arrival. Of, and that's the energy that I would calculate in my transmission loss, okay? And the spreading of signals to other beams has to do with scattering off the bottom of the ocean or what have you, so that they can get spread at long ranges or at some range due to scattering from the ocean, okay? Away from broadside, I get multipath spread, 
okay? And that's because I have conical beams and something coming in on one path, a bottom bounce path and a direct path, come in at apparent different, they come in at different conical angles and apparent different uh, azimuthal angles, okay? But is that coherent or not? It could be coherent or it couldn't be coherent. You don't say you lose the signal gain when that happens, okay? The conical beam width is given by this equation, and the basic idea is that if I have enough aperture that I can resolve the two paths by the uh, vertical, by the projection of the array, then these will come in at different beams. So in this particular case that I show here, where there's something at two, array, two arrivals 15 degrees apart, and, and uh, 60 degrees off broadside, something like 50 line wavelengths will resolve the multipath into different apparent beams. We sometimes have used end fire arrays to resolve uh, two arrays that have different vertical angles of arrival, both from up or both from down. And uh, sometimes this has been used with so-called match field processing uh, in the literature. Uh, how do we measure these things? Well, we can measure, if we're trying to get a ray gain out of things, we can measure a couple of things. We can try to do pairwise measurements and infer array performance, okay? And we can do this coherence function, except we can keep the phase instead of taking the magnitude squared, okay? The magnitude gives us a temporal stability, and we can look at the phase across the array and say, does it correspond to some wave front hypothesis, and is, is it stable uh, with regard to that hypothesis? We can, another thing we can do, which I'm a big believer of, is measure the bottom line whenever, whenever possible, and we can do beam response, we can do uh, what we call array signal gain, and either approach may use a sparse, a sparse array. Okay, so this is some data, again, from this swap experiment down at Fort, Fort Lauderdale, in 2007, and this is the courtesy of Kevin Heaney who worked with us on this. So we have, in this particular case, we have a long horizontal array, uh, east-west, uh, in shallow water, a tow up the coast, radially, so it's coming in near broadside. Uh, we form multiple closely spaced beams near the tow direction, okay, and we reserve the beam response as a function of range, We'll get the main load width, it's splitting, bearing areas, side load levels, et cetera. In this case, we use two different size apertures, one case 60 wavelengths, the other case 120 wavelengths, and we can repeat this for different tow directions. Okay, and what was, the signal that was towed here in this particular time was a narrowband signal, and it went on and off. So it was on for a while, and off for a while, on for a while, off for a while. That way we could look at signal to noise ratio with and without it being there. And this is how this signal changes with a function of range over something that was only five kilometers. And here's the same type of thing that we would see at 120 kilometers. So you can ask yourself, hey, how big an array could I use in this environment? And what should I say about how coherent things really are? Well, there's lots of variability. And so there aren't a nice simple answer to some of these questions. Okay, this is an example from that same data set of beams of different uh, uh, beam widths or different aperture lengths at a, at a range of nine kilometers. And you see sometimes it's nice and narrow with a big beam and sometimes we have big side lobes associated with it. With a short aperture we get a nice smooth fat thing, but again we're not getting the resolution and the gain. All right. So in summary, I've tried to attempt, I've attempted to sort out some of the many meanings of the word coherence, and I've been unable to answer why the Navy hasn't exploited it. Uh, some of the spatial measurements that are reported are really measurements of temporal stability, okay? In all of these measurements, space, time, and frequency scales matter, and sometimes they're not presented. Uh, when using the term coherence, Please describe the measurement if I want to read it and provide a careful interpretation of it. And let me say here, 
I, if you think there's some way of exploiting this coherence, please let me know what it is, and I'll try to exploit it. And finally, I don't have the answer to the question, what does it mean when I say that the ocean is very coherent? Congratulations, Walter, thank you for what you've done for me over the years and for what you've done for our nation. Thank you. I was hoping that Bill Kerry had solved the issue of the definition of coherence. <laughs> and I'm sorry to hear that it hasn't been solved. <laughs> Some of you know about Bill Kerry's. Very white ones. Yeah, very white ones. Okay, the next talk um, about signal processing is by Matt Getchu. And he's uh, going to tell us all about signal processing from the beginning to the end. That's right. As I know. I'm Matt Jetchu. Uh, it sounds like a jet in a shoe. Probably going to put that on there from that one. Um, this is the session where we have um, electrical engineers talking about things about the ocean that I guess none of us have had oceanography classes and getting invited to these conferences <laughs> because we know Walter. And so thank you very much for um, having the opportunity to talk on your 100th year. And, uh, I got my start, I guess, the, uh, with Walter on the Herb Island experiment a long time ago. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And so when uh, Peter was putting together this conference, I had the uh, opportunity to um, peek at everybody else's um, abstracts at a time. And I noticed no one else was talking about Herb Island. So I thought I would put a Herb Island sort of abstract in. But, um, and then I thought, Okay, oh, sorry. Uh, I guess I have to stand over here. Um, uh, so let me just start. I guess Heard Island, well, I, I just graduated with, uh, from Michigan, um, working with a signal processor named Ted Birdsall. And I was looking for a job, and I didn't really have a job. And he said, well, um, there are these guys at Scripps Institute of Oceanography that are going out to do this experiment, and they need someone uh, he was going to go man a uh, uh, listening post, and I think Ted went to Bermuda, and or might have, might have that backwards. I think Ted maybe went to Whidbey Island, and Kurt Metzger, someone many of you know, went to uh, Bermuda, and uh, they needed someone to generate the M-coded signals on the ship with Walter. So they said, "Well, why don't you go?" So uh, then I remember Bob was there, and he said, "Well, what do you know about those? Have you uh, read Kurt's thesis?" And I said, "Yes, yeah, so I did." So. I was uh, accepted to go on the, <laughs> to generate them. Um, anyway, uh, I went, and then um, it was, it was a you know, fantastic cruise. It was a joy to be with Walter for six weeks on that, or seven weeks, I think, on that ship. Um, we found things to do. We even wrote a paper uh, together, um, trying to, uh, um, and about, a, well, we wrote, the whole goal was to see if we could write a paper while on the ship, and I think we, we kind of accomplished that. But it took a little while to get it accepted. Um, anyway, uh, so here's some data. And many of you know, if you've listened to Walter um, um, talk, you think he says one of the things that's been key to his career is to ask the correct questions, not necessarily getting the right answers, so asking the right questions. So um, when I came to Scripps, we started analyzing this data. And we, he, the two of us came up with a question 25 years ago already, and we didn't have an answer. And I think um, through some of the signal processing that we're doing now, we might, I don't know, I think we have the beginnings of an answer. So I'm going to try and answer one of the questions that we had. Um, so uh, this was a record of um, a transmission from Heard Island to Christmas Island. There was a, about 10,000 kilometer path length difference, I think. Uh, and you can see it's just sort of a jumbled mess here. And um, yet, uh, this is the amplitude 
here, and this is, uh, so we set multiple M sequences over the course of an hour, and this is a record of these multiple M sequences going by. And, um, uh, and this is the travel time on this axis. Um, and then, uh, so, so the amplitude is represented here, as you can see. And then we started looking at the phase. There's this, as Harry was saying, there's this, everyone's talking about this wonderful coherence that you always see. And we could integrate these things for a long time, not for the entire hour, but for a long time because the phase along these peaks was constant, okay? And so um, uh, keeping that um, in mind now, this, this bottom plot is the same plot as you just saw, okay? But one of the mysteries was, and this is the question that Walter asked, was how does the um, travel time vary from right to left on this plot versus the phase? And we picked out several of these um, peaks in here and plotted that. And you can see that they're unrelated, right? There's sometimes the, they um, kind of go together, sometimes they go in opposite directions, sometimes they go in the same directions. And we were wondering what was going on. We didn't really know. Uh, at that same time, from some previous data that I had with uh, um, Ted Birdsall, we had done a really short range transmission, and I can't even remember the exact range, but it was something like 10 kilometers. Um, and um, we looked at, the, that data, and in that set of data, amplitude, or, um, travel time and phase are exactly, um, uh, you know, readily, uh, exactly related, but, you know, it should be, the relationship should be minus two, um, two pi times the carrier frequency, and that's exactly what this is. So they're related exactly like that. And so there's no, these are perfectly, co you know, coherent, I guess in another definition of coherence, <laughs> perfectly coherent. Uh, but these are completely uh, incoherent. And so I'm going to try to um, understand why that is today. And um, so here's, uh, Harry, here's something that I'm doing to try to uh, understand coherence and how to exploit it in the ocean. So I'm going to do a little detour through that before trying to answer that question at the end. Okay, and so, and I think you probably know about this, or I'm pretty sure already. So um, what I've done is, uh, this is a sort of, this is going on this, for my title, you know, from Heard Island to the Beaufort Sea, how we process data now, uh, uh, you know, and the progress we've made over the past several years. Um, as you know, we get these arrivals, and as uh, Harry showed, sometimes they're sort of scattered. So the typical arrival using a match filter on this plot is plotted in blue and in a decibel scale, and um, some of these are, you know, double arrival, uh, double sort of peaks together like that, scattered. Right, that's the typical definition of not having complete bandwidth coherence for that particular arrival. And um, if you were to look in time, as time goes by, of course it would change and that would be the definition of time coherence uh, affecting things. So uh, what I've done is built something called an estimator correlator and the history of that goes back to a couple famous people at, at, believe, at MIT, Price and Green, and they bounced radar signals off the moon. And it was kind of lost to me because it was I explained yesterday to some people about the that it was uh, all done in integral equations, and I, it was difficult for someone like me to you know to follow all that. And it's not done in you know it's not easily you don't think of that in the digital age these days. So, um, but it turns out to be pretty easy to implement um, because all you have to do is uh, is build a bunch of match filters instead of just one match filter. And the match filters that you build are all based on the um, eigenfunctions of the frequency covariance matrix um, that would be used to, that, that represents the scattering function um, that would be uh, the scattering function that scatters these arrivals. And so it's a pretty easy process. Um, it can be a little bit computational, computationally um, Difficult. I mean, it's more, more difficult than the match filter, but not that much difficult. It's more difficult. It just depends on how many eigenfunctions you might have have to need to um, do things. And so here's a little bit of the how to build one and what the, the um, uh, uh, eigenfunctions might look like. I choose to just use the coherence definition that uh, is from path integral theory. So you, it's from the structure function or whatever. So you have you assume some. What I do is I just assume a coherent bandwidth, some number for a coherent bandwidth, and build a coherence, um, that gives you a coherence function, and then build the frequency covariance matrix, factor that, and the first, and the 
the eigenfunctions that represent as much of the variance as you uh, can grab, uh, the biggest ones are the ones you use. And I've plotted those in the time domain here, so these are what the match filters are that you use in the previous block diagram. The first one is the blue one here, it's zero, no zero crossings. And the second one is the one with one zero crossing and the red one. So it's just, um, you know, the, the first one just kind of captures the entire pulse, whatever might be coherent in the first over the high entire pulse. And the second one captures whatever has, uh, might have flipped polarity in the, in the pulse and then so on and so on. If you let that coherence, uh, that assumed um, bandwidth coherence become very narrow, that would, um, you'd end up building something called an energy detector where you just uh, look, add up everything in all, um, at all frequencies independently, okay? So um, let me go back for a second to explain one more thing. Um, so you build these match filters based on the eigenfunctions. Um, so this, this is the match filter here. And then the output of the match filters, you square them, and, add up, and that means you're going to add them up incoherently at that point. And here you have a nice paper that's kind of like this, about where you're adding little subbands, and it's very it's kind of similar to this. And uh, as you know, and there's a, another nice paper by there was a person named um, I think his name is his last name is Morgan. It was at Bell Labs. Gilbert Morgan, right. And so he compared doing this kind of processing to the subband processing and the subband processing, right, is not quite as optimal as this, but not very far off. So it's a, that's a good way to think of things uh, intuitively is that you're just grabbing different subbands and trying to um, build match filters for those. Now what happens, now I assumed one particular coherence value for um, and I said I did in the previous plot, but what happens is that you can tune that number. So um, you might have an arrival that looks like this kind of sort of crazy scattered arrival here in this blue plot. And you can try different coherent bandwidths. And as you tune it up, I've decided in this case, the 15 hertz coherent bandwidth is the best. And that's because as you um, tune this, the signal to noise ratio goes up. Okay, so uh, as you and so you can see this peak rise up bigger over the the sort of scattered the level of the scattered peaks down below, and the other thing that happens sort of uh, a little bit counterintuitively is that the um, is that the pulse width it actually gets narrower uh, because although the total bandwidth of the transmitted pulse might be um, as narrow as one of these peaks in here, it doesn't. Um, uh, if you take the second moment of this entire thing, because the energy is scattered away from the mean, the center point, it's the, the actual pulse width is wider than this blue, uh, than the red um, best one. And so you can see as you add, as you tune the filter, the adding the, with, uh, you know, getting the best coherent bandwidth, the pulse width actually gets narrower. And then it's possible to overtune where you start to, the pulse width starts to get wider again and you start losing signal to noise ratio. So. Here is sort of the uh, result, um, and I think we saw some dot plots earlier today, and you kind of look at these and say which one is the best. Uh, you can do it kind of with that tuning diagram as I just showed, but this is an example of um, some Phil Philippine Sea data. Year day is this short little axis here, and as I go across, I have no tuning. This is the, just a regular match filter result. Here I've tuned the filter with a 15 hertz coherent bandwidth, and we have multiple um, well, I, I can also use, I can also extend this process in the ortho, orthogonal sort of direction, the time coherence. So I use different time coherence also because we had a longer sweep, we had a long sweep. So um, the two of them together can be tuned and not, can, that's all I'll say about that. But um, you pick out the one that you think is best. And um, especially, so here at the, the, these early arrivals, maybe it doesn't make so much difference except when you overtune, it kind of destroys things. Here at these later arrivals, you can kind of see that it's working quite a bit better and reducing all the little scattered peaks that would have normally showed up. Okay, so now, yeah, yeah. So um, um, that's just because. So this is completely untuned. So I just assumed. The program, I just told the program the, the coherent bandwidth is 10 kilohertz in 10,000 seconds. 
It's just, it's just huge. So it wouldn't affect anything. And uh, I just did that so I could use the same program and have the same calibration and everything else. Um, so, okay, so now there's a question of, well, what does it mean now to have a, an arrival with um, that estimator correlator processing? It's, it's not the natural match field processing, or it's not match filtering processing. So what does it mean in terms of an ar 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 array? And that's what I've been trying to work on recently. And um, the way that I've been trying to understand that is to use our, something called a trial of time sensitivity kernel. Uh, that is uh, maybe beyond the, uh, my time here to uh, explain, but uh, uh, we, you can, uh, the simplest, I guess, the way to think about it is that um, when we normally think about rays, we think that the sound speed, uh, the travel time that you um, measure is affected by any sound speed change along the ray path. And I've drawn a ray path here in this black line, okay? So, of course, you know that that line is infinitely thin. It's silly to think of that as that, you know, if there's a sound speed change off that ray path, that, you, you know, that would still affect things, right? But, you, you know, the, the, because it's a, there's a wave that's going by, it's not a, a thing. And once you can use the wave equation and the Born approximation and do a bunch of math and then and, uh, figure out um, how the sound speed affects the travel time and you can um, um, calculate this function called the travel time sensitivity kernel. So it's just a linear relationship between any sound speed change at any point in the ocean um, between the source and the receiver <coughs> as you're going along. And it can either be a positive change. So um, a, so a positive sound speed could be a uh, result in a positive travel time change, which is kind of silly. Anywhere along the... Um, Anywhere along this ray, it should be negative because when you have a sound speed change that is faster, the travel time should get slower, right? So um, this is the full uh, kernel, and it's sort of uh, funny looking a little bit because this particular ray is um, that I'm measuring this ray at this particular point, and it happens to be a triplicated arrival. You can't see on this scale that it's triplicated, but there's actually the wave fund wave front is folded upon itself in there, and that leads to this sort of extra, all well, this extra structure in here. And uh, if you look, if you zoom in, it's kind of a, a really um, fine scale structure that has alternates between the, the, you know, the red and the blue. And so I was thinking about when John was showing those pictures of the uh, corrugated, you know, the things that maybe somehow this, you could tune this somehow, I don't know, how, I would have no idea really how, but to, to look for those little things that you were talking about. But it somehow, I, I was thinking that this has got to be related to some what, what you're talking about. So having that picture really allows you to understand the, the wavelengths or the structure that would, uh, in the ocean, that's going to affect the acoustics. And so you could take the uh, two-dimensional Fourier transform, just like any good electrical engineer would and figure out what's happening. And you can see a bunch of different effects that are happening in here. Um, there are the loop, har these little lines are the loop harmonics that Bruce, the two Bruce's wrote about a long time ago. And um, this, um, this line is based on the, the uh, slope of the ray. Most of the rays, you know, as most of the time is going um, at a sloping angle for, um, as it's traveling. And then as it flips from side to side, it, sort of sweeps this out, I guess. Anyway, so. Now, these are two fields. This is a, actually, I thought this was a great picture of how the ocean operates, but now looking at everyone else's pictures this morning of how complicated it was, Brian, <laughs> I really, maybe I need to uh, update these, but this is, a, you know, these are the scales that the, meso, this is the mesoscale field, so it's operating on this scale, and the perturbations are pretty big, and the internal wave scale is a little bit smaller, and the perturbations are not so big. But having those two, you can kind of see how the sound is um, affected by the different uh, pheno or, uh, ocean phenomena. So you can take this thing and just filter uh, for the uh, internal waves. So things that are, have scales that are a little bit bigger than five kilometers and bigger in the, in the horizontal and 100 meters in the vertical. And you see that it's a little bit different structures than that. And the, for the, for the um, Mesoscale, you see it's basically just exactly follows along like a ray, which is fantastic because it tells us that the ray theory that people, that uh, Bruce and 
others have been using for uh, inverse theory is just, just fine. Nothing uh, worried to worry about. So here's the thing that I've been thinking about. In the Fram Strait, there's a, a place in the ocean where it has um, uh, that uh, our Norwegian colleague, uh, Hanna Sagan, is here, and she's going to talk about some of the Arctic acoustics tomorrow. But um, we've been working with her to understand some of the um, acoustics that, that she measured uh, on this experiment through the Fram Strait. Um, and that's a place uh, between Spitsbergen and Greenland where there's a deep water connection to the Arctic. So there's ex an exchange of deep water here. And there's a lot of current uh, coming from the Atlantic going uh, north, warm water, and cold water coming on this side of the uh, strait. And it produces some very strong features that really affect the acoustics in some very um, odd ways. You can see that there's this is a normal kind of ray coming through here. But then at the end, the mesoscale is so strong, um, it actually bent the ray like this. And we know this, we know this because we did a, a CTD section and, uh, very quickly across here. Um, and it's not, very, it's not very long. It didn't take, or not very, um, uh, not a very wide area. So you can do a CTD section in a fairly short order. But um, anyway, the construction kind of showed that this is, this is exactly possible. It matched what the data is. And I was, so I was trying to understand what would happen if they used a match or an estimator correlator here. And you, you can see how it worked. This is the full bandwidth up here on the top panel. And then using a 30 hertz coherent bandwidth, you can see how the estimator correlator um, was able to just average in just the right way for a reason I don't quite understand exactly uh, what, the, uh, what you would hope for is that you have this blue area that's exactly following where the ray path is. So that's really great. And here's an example where you overtuned. So I overtuned. I said the coherent bandwidth is too small, is, is only 10 hertz. That produces a, those uh, eigenfunctions that are really, would be really wide in the time domain. It would emit too much energy uh, from multiple paths. And you start to see that this whole uh, the, 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 um, TSK has really become something that's quite not very useful. Um, so uh, that was kind of, I think that's kind of nice. And I, I, I hope this holds together. I just did this in the, I, I've been working on this for a while and I couldn't quite understand it. And I, I think this is, hopefully this is going to be the correct explanation of what's been going on here. I have one final, um, try to, simple example, I thought, um, to try to show you about what is going on. I took three arrivals, this one, this one, and this one. Um, where it's a, uh, this is just a sort of standard simple arrival. This is a double arrival, so an up and down going array. And this is an arrival in the uh, final cutoff where things are scattered. Or uh, there's an, in, there's the, 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 it's the modes or it's the, you know, the interference pattern. And that's really what I wanted to understand. So um, here's the TSK for those three arrivals. The first one is something that you understand. It's just what I just showed. You have the ray path and then the blue TSK just lying underneath it, just like you expect. And I found this neat diagnostic of what's happening. You have this um, pulse that arrives here in the blue. And normally, we expect pulses to have stationary phase. And it does. So uh, this particular one, you can see the phase, which is in red, is, has, reaches a, you know, a, a stationary point right here at uh, the, the arrival time. The second one is two arrivals, okay? And I didn't use a beam former to separate them. They're just two arrivals coming in at exactly the same time. And they produce, of course, they're coming at the same time, they produce a, um, a pulse, which is, looks like just a regular single pulse. But the phase no longer has a stationary point. So um, this is a clue to the question, I think, about what's going on in those original Hurt Island Diagrams with those pics, those peaks that we saw, there are not really are not single ray paths, or they're just part of an interference pattern, right? So I think I mean maybe this is not a great revelation to some of you, but to me anyway, it seems interesting that there are different kinds of peaks. There's a peaks that have stationary phase, and there's peaks that don't have stationary phase. And when you go through all the mathematics actually of the TSK, it breaks apart into two pieces. There's a part that has uh, a stationary phase, and there's a second part that doesn't. And I was always wondering why that is, and, and, and 
uh, and here it just shows up in this this kind of picture. It's kind of amazing. Here's a and here's the final peak, um, or the fi yeah the final arrival where you have multiple arrivals or multiple ray paths coming in, and you have a scattered. Uh, uh, you have a much more complicated looking TSK, and here's the thing where you have a, a non-stationary phase again. And one other thing I would say is that, the, um, if I haven't run out of time yet, um, is that uh, the, um, this TSK I know is working correctly because um, it, if you do the integral this way and this way, um, this sensitivity should add up to being the um, same sensitivity as that along the ray. So, the, the, and that means the, um, you know, the, the uh, that way you know that it's working because the, the, the ray path, the integral of the ray path distance divided by the sound speed squared should be just the, um, the sensitivity, the number that you get and the, for the total sensitivity. And if you actually just put in a sound speed change constant across the whole thing, you could you can see that the whole peak would the peak would shift by that small amount, and so for this particular one I did that, and it does shift by the correct amount. These two, although they're pretty pictures, they don't work that way. These things don't add up. These these TSKs do not work. They don't they don't come out right. The numbers are wrong. So they're not only do they not only is it you know you and what that tells you is that the TSK is well it's it's not working. And that's because you violated the assumptions that you made when you um, built the TSK, and that was that you were going to um, just have one arrival. And if you think that, uh, you know, here you have two arrivals, and if you were just to change one of these, you know, the sound speed along here, all of a sudden you'd split that one arrival into two. And how is a linear process going to ever capture that kind of, you know, complexity? So it's just, it's, you've, you violated things at that point. So here's the, well, here's the, so there's the question I, I you know, try to answer. I don't know if I did it very well, but um, so that, I think that's the reason why these arrivals are not related in uh, the time, the time, per, the travel time perturbations and the um, phase perturbations. Are, these arrivals are not related like these simple ones are, and that's because these peaks are really just interference patterns and not, you know, straight ray paths like these these guys are. So. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to show this picture of us on uh, this. Remember, this is Walter explaining to Andrew Forbes and I about something or other on the ship at Heard <laughs> Island way back when. Probably we forgot to do something. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. But thank you very much. <laughs>
be doing full, first be doing beamforming, and so we'd be able to, and, and that would solve a lot of problems. I tried not, I mean, for that example, I you know didn't do that because I just wanted to have the simplest example. That would solve some problems, but or yeah. mode filtering. Mode filtering. <laughs> Maybe not to be short range. Yeah. <laughs> Art. Matt, just for uh, historic, I, I worked with Bob Price at Fort Bob, Paul Rainey. So those horrible integral equations, because what Kyle referred to this way, are so horrible web extensions. Right. <laughs> Okay.